man, I don't often get this excited for a review. <laughs> Hiya guys, today we look at the IBM 5155 portable personal computer. Yeah, this time it's not just a keyboard, but a whole computer. Loads of people made requests for looking at a vintage computer with its own special keyboard at some point, and now I can finally oblige. The IBM 5155 was what's basically the equivalent of a laptop, yes, a laptop, released in 1984. It cost a small fortune at the time, equivalent to about $10,000 now, and it featured a 4.77 MHz Intel 8088 processor, 256 kilobytes of RAM, two 5 5.25 inch floppy drives of 360 kilobytes each, a built-in 9 inch monochrome amber composite monitor with a resolution of 90 by 25 characters and adjustable brightness and contrast controls, and of course a flip down buckling springs detachable mechanical keyboard of the finest quality about which I'll be talking in a bit. When I was about three years old, my dad gave me one of these to play around with. It was a hand-me-down from his office he owned. He didn't need it anymore, so he figured it would be a fun and unique toy for me to play with. Even several years later, I was the only kid in school who had a PC, and I only had a single game to play on it, a computer version of Monopoly. This was way before PC gaming was even a thing. I played the absolute living crap out of this game as a kid, to the great dismay of my parents because the sounds came from a speaker inside the PC which you couldn't turn off or down, or at least we didn't know how to, and they foolishly put this in the room they slept in so I kept waking them up first thing in the morning to this sound. For my younger viewers, let me tell you how computers worked back in the day. First of all, you take out the floppy disk protectors from the station. Then you take the floppy disk, and they actually were floppy, with the operating system called DOS, and you put it in the top floppy drive. And then you take your floppy disk with the program you want to use and the files for it, for example, a text editor and your Word files, in the other floppy drive. You needed a floppy with the operating system on it because the computer didn't come with a hard disk to store the OS on, although you could get a 10 megabyte hard disk as an optional extra. Second, you switched on the machine using this deliciously chunky 80s power button and hear it roar to life. Then you waited as it literally counted the bytes of the RAM, 256 kilobytes in total, although you could expand it to 512 kilobytes, and when that was done, it loaded the operating system. For some reason, it asks me to put in the time and date every time I start it up. <laughs> Funnily enough, the current date is set to January 1st, 1980. And then it sets itself to the directory of the A drive. The A drive was generally the floppy drive you had the operating system on, and the B drive, the second floppy drive, was the working directory. If you had a hard disk, this became drive C, which is why computers even nowadays tend to start drive letters at C, even if you have no floppy drives. Then we go to B, C, D, Mono, Enter, Monopoly, Enter, and BAM! We have a program! I got this thing, which appears to have seen very little use indeed, off of eBay for about $300. And the results are obvious, I now have just a single digit in front of the decimal comma left on my bank account. And yes, that is my actual credit statement. But still, you know, for once I don't give a shit. This wonderful trip down nostalgia lane was worth every penny, and especially considering it's 100% fully functional and in damn good condition even, I'd call this beautiful piece of computing history an absolute bargain. 10 out of 10 would bankrupt again. Now this thing was roughly similar in specs to an IBM PC XT, but the novel thing about it was that it was the portable personal computer as opposed to the regular personal computer. Portable is a very relative term though, and at 13 and a half kilos, or 30 pounds, it was not exactly a packet of fucking peanuts or anything. I mean, compare it to my Dell Latitude laptop from my student days, a bit of a piece of shit I might add, it's not just nearly five times as heavy, but also a lot bigger. 
In fact, if you compare it in size to my previous computer, you'll see it's actually slightly larger than a modern computer tower. Moreover, it doesn't have batteries, so it runs off of mains power, not exactly a common find in trains nowadays, let alone in the 80s. But it does have a carrying handle the size of a Micronation, and the monitor, keyboard, and floppy drives are all integrated, so that was basically their definition of a laptop, I guess. Note that it wasn't the first with this idea, it was a reaction to the highly popular Compaq Portable, and IBM released their first and rather revolutionary portable computer, the IBM 5100, in 1975, which, adjusted for inflation, would cost about 90 grand nowadays. Anyway, onto the keyboard, it's a variation of the IBM Model FXT keyboard, which I've reviewed before, and it has the same layout, but there are a number of very large differences between the two. The Model FXT was the keyboard that came with the non-portable PC, and it's more or less the granddaddy of all Buckling Springs keyboards. Weighing in at 2.6 kilos with a thick metal back panel and metal back plate as well as a metal barrel plate, it is a steel behemoth that could see you through a zombie apocalypse or gang war with equal ease. Filed under blunt weapon, it is rumoured that several dozen murders are committed each year using these. The portable PC keyboard uses the same mechanism, but obviously weight was more of an issue, so they left out the metal back panel, making it out of tough plastic instead. And overall, they managed to bring the weight down to only 1.9 kilos. That's just the weight of two 2016 Apple MacBooks and some change. The paint job is also a little bit different. The FXT is all white, or all beige rather, while the portable board has a darker grey plastic insert that makes it look vaguely like an industrial model. It looks kick ass. Instead of the thick black XT cable used on the FXT, it's got a small ribbon connector with a terminal jack on the end, but almost the entirety of the length is coiled so it stretches really well and it tucks away beautifully into this neat little compartment here. Although it's an RJ connector, I've been told it actually still speaks XT, so if you have an XT converter, all you need is wire up an adapter from this to that, and then it should work on a modern PC. You can flip out the keyboard using these two clips at the top, but you can also completely detach it using these two things at the bottom, like so. And as it happens, those things also double as flip out feet rather comparable to the ones on the model fxt it's a really neat system and as a result you could use it detached like this not even a modern laptop has that and apart from the staggering build quality of this thing that's not the only thing you get over a modern laptop instead of those crappy chiclet keys you get on those or apple's reviled new butterfly switch you get proper full travel mechanical key switches with IBM's sublime capacitive buckling spring mechanism. These are honestly some of the best switches ever made. I've tried so many switches by now and it'd be impossible for me to not place this at least in the top three of the best switches ever made. They're also clicky as all hell, way clickier than anything Cherry or Alps or whatever people can come up with. Listen to this. One fun thing to note is that although it's about as loud as the regular model FXT, in fact it sounds pretty much the same, but the pitch is noticeably lower. Here, listen to this. Basically, in terms of typing experience, is divine, about as good as it gets, way better than the later Model M. And as a bonus, it even has inherent N key rollover, so you can press as many keys together as you want. Although, <laughs> I can't think of any games you'd need that on, but this computer would run. <laughs> The keycaps are also magnificent, they're IBM's typical massive chunks of PBT with die sublimed lettering. And not just normal die sub lettering, like the model FXT, they're some of the nicest, boldest and sharpest prints I've seen on the board. PBT doesn't yellow, and because this has seen so little use, the texture on them is still pristine. In fact, because the thing is normally stored closed against the computer, the whole keyboard is super duper clean, it's really nice. 
and being rated at 100 million key presses for every key, reliability is also not likely to be an issue. The layout is of course a bit weird, in fact even in 1981 people thought it looked off, but it's honestly not that hard to get used to. Just use numlock a lot to toggle between numbers and arrow keys, and remember the strange positions of the control, alt, and caps lock keys, and basically you're all set. So, of course, I'm chuffed to fucking bits with this computer. Sure, the floppy disks have less storage space than my pinky finger, and I've seen specks of dust flying around that have more RAM than this, so from a computing perspective this thing is laughably low spec compared to today's standards. But think of it like this, it's built better than my previous house, and despite being over 30 years old, it still works like the day it came out of the factory. Not something you can say of most laptops, and it comes with one of the most kick-ass keyboards ever made. And that's counting non-laptop keyboards too. It blows even modern keyboards clean out of the water. I mean, what keyboard do you know that feels this good, sounds this clicky, or comes with keycaps half as good as these? That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this computer.